Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, where today's health leaders help to forge the leaders of tomorrow. I'm your host, Mark Bonica, of the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Our website is healthleaderforge.org, where you can find information about subscribing to the podcast, links and information related to the episode, as well as our complete archives. Today's guest is Sean Tracy, the founder, CEO, and creative director of Sean Tracy Associates, a full-service marketing and brand strategy firm located in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I spoke with Sean because over the years, his firm has worked extensively with healthcare organizations, helping them craft their internal and external brands and marketing strategies. In this podcast, we talk in particular about his work with Wentworth Douglas Hospital, but Sean has worked with many other healthcare organizations, including developing the Tufts Health Freedom Plan brand with Tufts Health and Granite Health, Boston Children's Hospital, and Hartford Health. He is currently working with the newly formed North Country Healthcare, whose CEO, Warren West, has been a previous guest on The Forge. Sean has also worked with large national brands such as Sears and MasterCard. This was a fun interview because Sean has done so many diverse and interesting things in his career, including being a jazz trumpeter, producing a TV show called The Best of New England, and making a feature-length documentary called The Jesus Guy. One of the things I found most interesting was our conversation about leadership in an industry where most organizations are project-based and teams may form for a day or many years, depending on the length of the project. We close on a discussion about developing a personal brand, which I think is particularly valuable to think about. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Don't forget to leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. Thanks for listening. And here is Sean Tracy. Welcome to The Forge, Sean. Thank you, Mark. Nice to be here. So you went to Brown University where you majored in philosophy and religious studies and minored in electronic music composition. What drew you to Brown and specifically why philosophy and religious studies? Well, Brown, probably because it had this open curriculum philosophy at the time, which okay. um, was really gave you an opportunity to be entrepreneurial in your own education. You kind of molded it yourself. And that was very attractive to me. I started off in philosophy and eventually switched my major to religious studies. Oh, okay, so and so my actual degree is in religious studies. Okay, and that was mainly because as I was in the philosophy department, they loaned some professors to the uh, from the religion department, and I loved them. And I just felt that they, you know, they kept referring me. Oh, you're going to love this other course. They're going to love this other course. Okay. and they were kind of referring me to take courses in the religious studies department. Okay, and at the time, it was known as the best department in the university with the best thinkers, the best writers, and there was a lot going on there. It was a very powerful experience. So by the time I got a few years into it, I had, you know, that's where I was. So you had you the know, major. At I had it, and, <laughs> and, and, and I liked it. And, yeah. you know, uh, so I did other things, obviously, uh, anthropology and some uh, sociology and then music and sculpture and other things. But, yeah. Um, the religious studies department was just fascinating. The, what the, was the it people. specifically that drew you to it? Uh, just really, it was the level of the professors, okay. the level of the thinking that was going on there, yeah. and, uh, and the subject matter, a lot of utilitarian ethics, comparative religion, it, just approaching, it was just approaching some of the subjects that I was very interested in, in a very, very interesting way. You didn't have any vision of going on to, like, becoming ordained or something? No, or something, did you? no, I never thought about, about doing that. But that would be the road from something. Uh, well, made, or a lot of the students sitting next to me became rabbis or priests, uh -huh. or uh -huh. for sure. But a lot of them were, and I think this was really the path that I was thinking. I actually thought it, for most of my time at Brown that I was going to go into ethical law and deal with things like abortion, euthanasia, sort of heavy, heavy-duty philosophical subjects. Mm -hmm. So cool. that's kind of where I thought I was going. All right. So, but you Didn't were also end up there. Yeah. <laughs> so you were also doing uh, electronic music composition. Uh, how did you get involved with music, and what, what, what do you what did you play? I've always been a musician. Okay. I have three brothers that were on the road as musicians when I went to college. Very successful. 
And I made my way through junior high school, high school, always playing in a band, playing in a jazz band, playing, you know, and I played trumpet mainly was my top instrument. Yeah. And I also played uh, keyboards, played, you know, a Hammond B3 organ and a rock band and oh, piano and, you know, funk bands and a little bit of everything. So I, I, I've always done that and found it very interesting. So what was the electronic music attraction? They had a department, they had a very unique little department that hardly anybody knew about called the McCall Studio of Electronic Music. And Brown and Dartmouth, believe it or not, were um, very much at the forefront of inventing some some very, very cutting edge um, synthesizer technologies at the time. The ARP series was developed at Dartmouth, I think. And in the McCall Studio, we were working with the Synclavier. And the two universities were collaborating and we were developing polyphonic sounds and things that sounded like real instruments that hadn't been done before and sampling and those kind of things. So it was just fascinating. And it was an interesting way to compose. I started out trying to do composition in the normal way through the regular part of the music department, but it was really difficult because I wasn't a classical piano player. And so to play your own compositions was really almost impossible for me. And so one of the professors says, well, you can't even do this course unless you can compose. And then I found, there was a guy that did, I forget his name, but he did this thing way back when called Switched On Bar Bach. And well, I he, think I've heard that. Yeah, okay. and yeah. He, did, yeah. Um, he did Bach with synthesizers and uh -huh. recorded it. Uh -huh. And uh, so I found that, and I, so I went back into my professor and I said, I can record all of it, I can compose, and then I can go to the electronic music studio and I can compose it. Or I can put it all together on a recording studio, track by track, piece by piece, because I can play one thing at a time. I can play two things at a time. I just can't play many things at a time, you know, on the piano. So um, that's what I did. And I started there, and then I loved the whole idea of being able to compose electronically and all of the things that it gave you, multi-track recording and everything else. Okay. And also at this time, you were doing large-scale installation sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design, which I, I has a relationship with right. Brown, right? Yeah, it was a list studio at Brown, and I think my teacher, um, Marlene Malik, also taught at RISD. Okay. And uh, she did this kind of thing. I tried regular sculpture, and then I tried uh -huh. painting and whatever, and then... I discovered this sort of conceptual installation sculpture, which was what is like that? it's you know like doing a like I, I took the the um, the the, um, the main green on campus, and over the course of a, a night, I created a tree. Okay. In the middle of the campus, that didn't exist before, and it was wrapped sort of like a paper mache type thing. But what I did was I actually took a huge branch that had fallen off of somewhere. I got a bunch of guys to drag it out and, and stick it in the ground with me. And then I, I wrapped the thing first and stuck it up in the air. And it probably went up like 30 feet or more, 40 feet. And then you kind of stand around and you watch people and what their responses are. And they thought it was a wireframed thing. They thought it was something that I invented from scratch. And they said, well, that doesn't look like an organic thing. It could, a tree could never grow like that. Look at the way that those branches happen. And, and you just laugh because, you know, it is a real tree underneath. So you, right. you're basically kind of suspending people's beliefs and perceptions and exploring. I built buildings within buildings that people would have to walk through spaces and experience things and made them do things that they didn't like to do, like walk under ladders or, you know, and just see how people react. Interesting. So it was kind of behavioral anthropological, uh -huh. a little bit of, you know, psychology, sociology, all built into like manipulating people with sculpture, large scale. Yeah. So pe people walk through the space that you're creating a walk around the item as opposed to look at it on a little pedestal. This is interesting. So it sounds like, I mean, I'm hearing kind of some related themes here coming. You, you made this transition to religion. You're asking these kind of big and interesting questions. You're doing music, but it's not traditional music. You're doing art, but it's not kind of what people would typically think of as art or, or, or standard, you know, kind of standard right. studio kind of. Interesting. Okay. So, so um, I think after you graduated or at some point here, you also had a uh, kind of a career going as a jazz pianist and trumpeter? Was that after college or? or all through. Or that was all, all the way through. All the way through. Okay. Um, and a little bit after. Um, 
I went on the road with my brother's band when I was 13 and 14 for the summers. Oh, wow. Played to, you know, 3,000 people, 5,000 people in the stadium. Opened up for Glenn Campbell and other people like that. It was sort of like the Jackson 5 slash Osmond Brothers kind of thing. And that was sort of the, the young kid that, you know, came out and sang, played a few instruments and, you know, it was exciting. It was, yeah. it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, and then I did that throughout high school um, with my own band and in college with a big jazz band at the university. Um, and then I played in nightclubs and places all the time. You know, that was one of the reasons why I gravitated towards Brown. I had been accepted at um, Yale and Dartmouth and a few other places that didn't really have a venue, didn't have a town, a city big enough for me to make some money on the side while I was going to college. So. Okay. Providence had a really good jazz scene at the time and some other places where I could play pop music and R&B and other stuff. So I kind of earned my way through college doing that. So so you finished at Brown and what was next uh, with all this interesting kind of uh, thinking <laughs> and experimenting? What, what came after Brown? It came fast and kind of surprisingly. Okay. Um, as I said, my brothers were in the music business and one of them uh, who was sort of the front man of the show band, as they called it in the time, was very interested in getting into television. And okay. he, was, he's, he had a good, uh, uh, good presence, right charisma. And um, so he asked me, even when I was in college, to start helping him write some vehicles, some shows, to see if he could you know, get something picked up. So we wrote a bunch of shows together and... Um, Shortly after I got out of college, one of them got picked up and they said, yeah, let's do this. And so all of a sudden I was writing, producing and directing a TV show. And what was the TV show? Uh, at first it was actually in New Hampshire. It was called The Best of New Hampshire. Okay. And then it turned into The Best of New England was on WCVB in Boston. Okay. And six or seven other New England stations. So it was, that was fun. And it went on for a couple of years. So is this, was this when you started Sean Tracy Associates? Right. Almost simultaneously, I started to get um, invited by agencies and some advertisers directly because they liked the way some of the things that we were doing in the show were quite unique. And so they said, do you ever do commercials? Would you do a commercial for us? And so I started writing and doing those, and I formed a... Um, a commercial production company at that time wow. back in 85. So uh, I'm not a video guy so when you say doing something unique can you explain kind of to a neophyte what that might have been? What uh, was it that drew them to the, you? The work that I did in those days was certainly more prevalent today than it was then. It was kind of a hybrid between um, almost like reality TV um, what's now you know ubiquitous now where you're using real people and it's kind of semi-scripting them into situations or you're using real people in eliciting real responses from them. And sometimes you're using actors to portray real people. Okay. Right? Yeah. So you're, bl you're kind of manipulating that line between sort of reality and commercialism. Which, as you said, I guess kind of goes back to my yeah, days yeah. in sculpture That's and it. other things. So that it's kind of... It all makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> when you look at it over the course of 30 years, it makes yeah. sense. It starts to make sense anyway. It doesn't look as random as it did no, to me at the definitely. time. No, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, and let me back up for a second. So you also, you're, you're involved with uh, Taekwondo. So I want to kind of get all your kind of creative okay. things thrown out there real quick. Yeah. Um, How'd you well, get involved? How I, did you start doing that? I started Taekwondo in Fitchburg, Massachusetts, where I went to school, uh -huh. and uh, there was this guy that moved in and took this quiet little studio downtown, nobody had ever heard of it, of what Taekwondo was, but he opened up, and I happened to be walking by it a whole bunch of times, and I saw him, you know, kicking and punching a heavy bag, and, and there was like no students, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I asked my parents, I said, could I go in there and ask him, like I could do that, take class or something? And uh, they said, sure. So I went and spoke to him. He's a, a um, Korean man. I'm trying to remember his name now. Kohi Shin was his name. And I think he was a sixth or seventh degree or Dan black belt from Korea. And I was just fascinated with what he was doing and the power that he could exhibit. And he was not a big guy, but he could really 
hit the bag and do other things. Um, so I trained there for a while and did pretty well, but eventually I blew out my knee in a competition. I got, oh. got hit in a competition in Canada and it kind of turned my whole kneecap around backwards and uh, it was not a pretty thing. Was so um, the end of that then? It was the end of that for a while because okay. the doctors in Boston that I saw that were doing the Bruins and everything, they said, well, you know, you're young and if you did this, you know, if you were a hockey player or whatever, we'd fix it, but we're not that good at it. You know, at those days, they don't have the skills that they have in the orthopedics that they do now. That would have been a simple operation then. I'm sure it would have been great. But they just said, you know, you got a 25% chance of, you know, getting better, 25% chance of getting worse, and 50-50, it won't do much at all. And they said, why don't you just do weights, train, you know, see how, how it goes for a little more than, you know, six months or a year. And if you're okay to walk on it and do this, most of the things, just skip the Taekwondo. Because that really puts a lot of torque on your knee. Sure. Uh, so I did. Okay. And I got back and, but then it was not long after that that I ended up, by the time I got healed up and everything, I was in college and the college didn't really have a good Taekwondo program yeah, yeah. and none of the people in town in Providence had anything that really resembled what I was doing before. Yeah. And uh, so it was many years later, I moved to Nashua, I didn't really like what was going on there. I moved to Portsmouth and I walk in and I'm looking at this place. I said, I wanted to get back when right? I saw this school. Yeah. I walked in the door to see what it was like. And I watched a class through a window, a glass window. And it was exactly what I had learned as a 13-year-old. And now I'm 30. Yeah. It blew my mind. Yeah. And so the master instructor comes in and he introduces himself. And he asked me into his office. And I sat down. And uh, it just was all so familiar. And then I said, so I, you know, I wasn't going to really divulge anything. I don't know why I didn't want to say, but he finally dragged it out of me. And he says, you seem very interested in very what I said. Yeah, I studied when I was young. And he said, where? And I said, Fitchburg, Mass. And he said, with Kohi Shin. And I said, yeah. He said, oh, we, we had the same master in Korea. Oh, nice. Nice. So there you go. There you go. So it was the same deal. And, and okay. so I continued along from there and eventually uh, got a black belt and got a second and a third and a fourth. Oh. Kept up with it for quite a while. My, we have, I think it's 13 black belts in my family, if you count them all up. My wife's a fifth degree master. Wow. And my son is a, 18 year old son is a third degree and my daughter's a second degree. So you're still doing it? I haven't been for a few years. Okay. Um, but I am still threatening to go back. <laughs> I really want to get my fifth in, so hopefully. Okay. So how do all these things tie together? As a person who's involved in the creative, creative uh, pursuits, does this all kind of come together in some way? Does it all inform it? Does, do these things inform each other? Uh, all the different things you've done? That's, I don't do them to inform one another. I do them because mm -hmm. I'm interested in them. Mm -hmm. um, but... I think that having interests, mm -hmm. having things that um, you do that's outside of your job um, definitely enhances your life, for one thing, keeps things interesting. But, you know, in a perfect world, you're also bringing some of those understandings or teachings or learnings back into what you do. So there's certainly a lot to be learned from, from practicing Taekwondo. It's a mind, body, spirit type endeavor. There's, there's some pain involved. <laughs> you know, you're constantly doing the same things over and over and over for 20 years, trying to perfect the smallest thing, like a kick or a punch. And when you do, you see the results. I mean, I've smashed through, you know, four blocks of concrete with my palm, and I'm not a huge guy. And I've seen guys that are 200 and, you know, 80 pounds and look like they should be able to do it can't get through one. So it's mind, it's technique, it's being able to focus your energy in a way and focus your, um, your attention. So that's what you can learn from Taekwondo and from playing music. You can be, learn creativity, you can learn timing. Um, timing is really important in, in marketing and advertising. Um, you know, phrasing, timing, staging, how, you know, how you, you in, in marketing many times we're we're creating a world, we're creating an environment in an ad or in a TV commercial or a radio spot or something, you're creating a reality that doesn't exist from scratch. So it's a creative endeavor as well. So I, I saw you, you produced a documentary, The Jesus Guy. How did you get involved in that? That was a pre-Sean Tracy or have I got my timelines? 
No, there was a, a great sort of period in my directing, commercial directing career where I had a company here, Sean uh -huh. Tracy Associates in New England, and I had an office in Boston, uh, Newbury Street at one point and on Arlington Street at another point. But at the same time, I threw my hat in the ring in sort of a national arena. So I was represented by a company in Canada called The Partners, which was the largest commercial film production company in the world at the time. They had offices in Sydney and London, Toronto and LA and New York. And eventually I went to work for a guy that just really impressed me when I learned about his work. His name was Albert Maisel's, Maisel's Films in New York City. And he was a documentary filmmaker that also had a commercial division. And so I worked with him for a couple of years and got the bug for making a documentary. And so I was always looking for a subject. Mm -hmm. And I found this article in Time Magazine about this wandering evangelist who was barefoot and bearded in a robe. And people thought they called him the Jesus guy. And um, the Time Magazine article was fascinating about him. And so I ripped it out and put it on my desk and sort of never had time to like really pursue it, but it was there, right? I had a folder full of ideas, right? And uh, I, most of the work that I was doing in those days in commercials was with SAG actors. And they went on strike, okay. uh, Screen Actors Guild. Okay. And uh, so they went on strike and I talked to somebody who was a negotiator on the commercial, independent commercial producer's side, who was a friend of mine, actually produced for me. And he said, this strike's gonna go on for at least a year. You better get to Canada or do something. So I, you know, sort of uh, re-upped my uh, relationship with the company in Canada and started shooting up there a lot. But in the meantime, um, this article kept coming to the top about the Jesus guy. Yeah. So I had a little time and I said, let's do this, right? So I. I picked up the phone, I tried to find him, you know, I had to go, around. it took me a long time to even find him. He doesn't carry a phone, um, as you might expect. Yeah. But, uh, so it was kind of a calling. It actually happened and things just kind of fell into place. And so I made a documentary film about um, this guy. It took me about five years on and off. Okay. I wasn't doing it all the time, right. but I would spend five days or 10 days, you know, shooting, following him wherever he was. And then, a lot of time in post-production and finally get it made. So, because uh, I know nothing about this world, um, you would go wherever he was and it would be you with a camera or would it a, be a The funny thing is that, yeah, that I learned be? a lesson from, from Albert Mazels for one, who is this great documentary uh, guy. And he said, you know, don't bring anybody that you don't have to because it's gonna change the nature of what you're doing, especially in that kind of a situation. So I started off with like three or four people, an audio person, somebody, you know, assisting running lights, somebody just running interference and getting releases and, you know, producer type. And, and I was shooting them, uh, operating the camera. And um, eventually I learned that when everybody else had sort of gone to bed and I'd released the crew and I was still around and if I had the camera around or whatever and I'd be wrapping up and then somebody would come over and want to talk to this subject, right? That I'd have to rip the camera out and whatever. I always found that when it was just me there and him and another person he was talking to, I got way better stuff than when there were four people, one with a big boom mic hanging over. It just was very intrusive. So I let everybody go and I just made the rest of the film on my own. And it was hard, yeah. but, but a good experience. It was, I learned a lot because the, you know, the other work that I did was you know, 40 people crew with cranes and somebody to do every little bit of everything, you know, and, and in ways that's so much better that you have a big crew that really talented people doing lighting and audio and props and wardrobe and everything else you could possibly conceive. But on the other hand, it's a big ball and chain to be dragging around when you're just trying to move and be nimble and get, get something without anybody noticing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, let me ask, financing a project like like the Jesus guy. How, yeah. how did that work? Because these are, I'm assuming I don't know. you, you said you let tell me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, but I mean, you, you said you let people go. So I'm assuming you were kind of the, the principal in that yeah. project and you yeah, know, that, hiring. When, and, I eventually, I thought about forming a nonprofit for it. And uh -huh. I had people um, at, um, in Washington, D.C. that had seen some of the early work, Docs in Progress and some other foundations and things. And they really 
got into it. Even Albert Mazels told me, he said, I can get you funding through HBO, Sheila Nevins. We'll get this thing finished and whatever. And, you, you know. and then as I started to do this by myself, I said, well, I don't really need that much money. And I don't really want to be encumbered to anybody to have any rights to like the cut or what it is or where it was going to be going or aired or whatever. So, so I just self-funded it eventually. Okay. Okay. It wasn't that, wasn't that bad since yeah. I was the only guy I had to pay. <laughs> right. So, okay. What makes a, a good story? So you were after something. You had this sense that there was a story there to be told. You were working with a guy who you said, Maisel's, Ma Maisel's Yeah, right? Albert Maisel. Yeah. Uh, who you said is a, a really good documentary story mm -hmm. maker. So what makes a good story and why did you think the Jesus guy would, what was your gut that the Jesus story would, the Jesus guy would be a good story? He's a fascinating character. So if you okay. start with a good character and he, he, you know, it's like one of these guys who you say, he can carry the show, you yeah. know, because he's just fascinating. He's very intelligent yeah. um, and kind of an enigma and a little bit, you know, definitely a bit of a curiosity in this day and age. So a good character and I think a good story has a beginning, a middle and an end and some conflict. And we certainly had good conflict. I broke my own rule, though, and that there was no ending, which is why it took me like almost five years of filming yeah. is that I kept waiting for him to either whatever quit you know or, quit or, or, become a car dealer i, I don't know <laughs> get married yeah, i don't know yeah, i'm yeah. waiting for you know and realistically yeah. i didn't think that might happen but there was some rumor that he was going to get called to the vatican and meet the pope and that they were going to kind of you know take over his mission or help him with his mission or something and i ended up talking to a couple of bishops that said that he had been investigated by the pope and and they they were tracking him and there's a couple of there's a bishop in my in the film actually that talks about that but he just kept doing the same thing and it just kept going on and on and on and i remember going back to albert mazels and susan Fromke, who was a great director at his place and saying when do i stop filming and and susan said you know i've been there before where you don't do a film or a story that has a defined period of time he said, you can be doing this for 20 years so she said, I'd stop whenever you want and get the film made because you certainly have enough material. At that time, I can't remember, I had a, maybe 150 hours of film. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I kind of disregarded my own good rules. I didn't really have an ending. So it's just this film just kind of fades into the distance at the end. You kind of see he's kind of walking away into the distance and it just keeps going. Yeah. And that's how the film ends. Okay. You know, if you see this guy, you know, don't be afraid of him. Give him you know, it was a person that, that said this in, a, in an interview, this woman that knew him and said, you know, if you see this guy on the road, don't turn, you know, don't turn a, what is it, a dead eye or, yeah. you, know, f f you know, don't be afraid, you know, go and talk to him. He's a, he's a nice human being, something. So that's how the film ends. Okay. Uh, so it didn't have an ending. Yeah. Um, but normally, you know, good character, good story has, you know, beginning, middle, end, some conflict. But... Importantly, you got to figure out who your audience is because not every story is for every audience. I learned that on the film festival circuit. Okay. I went to the Bible Belt with it and other places and some people were vehemently against this guy. He's imitating Christ. He's the Antichrist. He's, you know, uh, sinning to pretend. And he doesn't pretend he's Christ, but he emulates the, the lifestyle of Christ. So you know, you really learn that your audience is very important. You know, you, you, you could choose to make a film or an advertisement or market towards a particular audience. And I think you should have that in mind, unless you're doing something like this, which was just my own project. So I really didn't have my, I was my own audience. I just wanted to make the film I wanted to make. Okay. That's an interesting statement. I've, I've heard you know, discussion like the difference between Art and graphic design is is something to do with. If I phrase this right. No, I'm going to just cut that piece. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it has to do with you. You're trying to graphic design's trying to solve a problem, whereas art starts with a problem and tries to find an art. That's what it is. I think. Ugh, I'm not going to get it. It's not going to come. Well, I you know what you're saying is kind of interesting in that um, I think that advertising. And that's what I was thinking. Differs you, from from art. It, it has a lot of similarities, and mm -hmm. in many ways, using the same tools and design mm -hmm. and and color and framing and uh, and other things. But what it's kind of nice about commercial work or advertising is that 
you know, you have a defined audience. It's very clear. You have a strategy that you're trying to support. Um, and so, and sometimes you have a very specific thing that you're trying to promote. So it just really narrows the possibilities down. And for yeah. somebody who's a real creative person, um, narrowing down the options is a really good thing because otherwise you can just go crazy. You can just keep right. going and going and going. And, right. You know, you can come up with a billion answers if there's no defined problem. So you were, you were kind of, you, you, you seem like you always have a, a, a number of different projects kind of going at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Is that, so you were at the same time you're working on the Jesus guy, you were also doing commercial work. Mm -hmm. So this was started roughly. So you, you founded Sean Tracy associates roughly in, in 1985 as a film production company. Uh, you were doing the best of new England at that point. Is that correct? Just finishing or it. Just yeah. finishing it. Okay. Yeah. And a, as a film production company, were you primarily working on advertising and that kind of production, or were, was it, uh, was no, it commercial it was production? It was all it was advertising. TV commercials at the time. Okay. When it started. Okay. And it, it eventually evolved um, to become a, what you refer to as a full service advertising and marketing firm. So tell me a little bit about the progression from 1985, you were a production firm, towards a full service. Uh, advertising and marketing firm, and, and what's the difference? Well, when I was only involved in television commercial production, I would work primarily for other agencies that were much larger than than my own. You know, doing national commercials and and really traveling a ton. You know, I was in L.A., New York, Toronto, Montreal, all over the place. And when my son was born in 1998. In fact, that year was, I think that was the year of the, the, the Screen Actors Guild strike or right after that. And so I ended up shooting a lot in Toronto. So I was 25 weeks that year alone living in the Intercontinental Hotel, shooting for Sears and MasterCard and Tim Hortons and, you know, pretty much every advertiser up there and realized very quickly that that wasn't going to be a good plan to have children. We wanted to have, you know, another. So um, wanted to revert back to having where I really started in the beginning and more of a full complement of creative and advertising. So in 2000, I formed uh, or started to solicit clients that were more than, uh, you know, more of a full service relation relationship. So we would do everything. We would do, you know, graphic design and, and logos and packaging and, you know, pretty much all of the traditional stuff in those days so that I could be home more and I could concentrate on my limit was a four hour drive as opposed to a four or six hour plane flight to LA so that I could be home at night. And realistically, there weren't enough national television clients to continue to do the work that I did as a commercial director within a four hour drive. I had to get on planes to do that work. So that sort of precipitated the idea to, you know, to form the agency and to do more work, more different, you know, different types of work for the clients that we were serving. So at what point did you start working with healthcare in particular? So you, you do, you've done a lot of work with financial. I've seen some of your advertising for different banks and how did you get involved in healthcare in particular? And what is unique about working with healthcare clients? Okay, I'm going to just um, clarify one thing. I'm going to go back mm -hmm. a little okay, bit, and, sure. and then I'll then I'll move forward with that. Yeah. But um, you know, as a full service agency, what we you know these days there's a, a ton of moving pieces. It's a lot different than it was even when I formed the company in 2000. But we ha handle virtually every marketing piece that our clients do now: branding, marketing strategy, budgeting, or helping them determine what their budgets ought to be. Um, graphic design, packaging, media planning, digital, social media, and then of course the traditional advertising. So it's, mm. there's a, just a lot of moving mm -hmm. pieces these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think maybe more important than ever to have a firm that can help keep all those pieces together and make them integrated. So that a company doesn't have somebody doing their video, somebody doing their social media, somebody doing something else, is that what you're? Yeah, there are some companies, obviously the bigger you get, the more likely it is that that may happen. 
but there are some companies that are really good at it. I, we, we've worked with some Hartford Healthcare, and I know the people there. They're, they're brilliant marketers internally, and they they can manage that. They understand how to manage their own brand internally, but it's a hard thing. And I think that if you're not that big or you don't have that large of an internal team with those kind of capabilities and that kind of experience, then there are so many bits and pieces these days and so many places that everything needs to be integrated and executed that it's good to have some help. To have a yeah. firm that can come in and kind of keep things um, on brand. Now, you did a lot of interesting things. You've done music. You did some, some um, uh, visual art, you know, and, and other things. So now you're talking about integrating into your firm and then you were you were doing for a number of years um, video production but now you're saying you brought on social media you brought in graphic design a bunch of other things and so you're managing all these things what was that like kind of learning to manage those aspects of the business well the good news is that um, there's a lot of great people out there I can't know or do everything so I keep my sort of eyes on the big picture and I hire people that know how to do the very specifics whether it's digital or design graphics packaging so I really focus on the big picture branding um, strategy and I still do all of my own television okay because that's just that's your thing that's a thing that I've done a lot of all my life so yeah. I, I have a hard time surrendering that to, okay to others so you still like to get behind the camera? I do. Yeah, yeah. I do all the time. Yeah, yeah it's exciting. It's, yeah. it's it's one of the most fun things that I do. Yeah, and I think that in a way, you know, I've learned that through others even that it, it's kind of the combination of everything. It's a combination of sound design and acting and uh, framing and choreography and art direction and and even music, you have a music score and dialogue. And so you put all that together and you end up with what used to be a film and is now is a video. Right. So in 2000, you, you now have this full service um, company and you've kind of specialized in, in financial services organizations and, and healthcare. Uh, how did you come to those particular Specializations, which just kind of just happened to be who you got a lot in the door, or or did you make a conscious decision to pursue those kinds of clients? It actually happened because of my experience in the television commercial directing world. I really did a lot of work for financial institutions like Mastercard, Bank of Montreal, um, and healthcare organizations. So over the years before I started the agency, I probably did television commercials from probably. I don't know, a good 25 to 50 percent of the major hospitals and health systems in New England and elsewhere. So my work, I understood those issues and I understood how to create emotion and to create stories that would be important to those particular things, uh, financial and healthcare. And the interesting thing enough uh, thing about this is that I worked with a guy from Harvard Public Health, Dr. David Shore, and he wrote a book called The Healthcare Trust Prescriptive, I think it was called. I can't remember exactly the name of it. But he said that when you're dealing with healthcare marketing, that trust is everything. And that trust is the intersection of ignorance and importance which is, I think, a really brilliant statement. That because when you sense. think about it, um, when you go to the doctor and they tell you or your loved one, a child or your wife or your husband, that you've got this issue, you're probably pretty ignorant. And even these days, you can go to the internet and search all you want and you'll find every answer from, you know, you got a real problem to, you know, do some alternative medicine and you'll be fine in a week. You know, you can find the whole spectrum. So what are you going to do? Somebody says, you need to go in and have this operation. You need to have you know, this done. You need to start taking this medicine, which is pretty serious. And you feel pretty ignorant. But it's really important. It might even be life and death. So those two things intersect. What do you do? You have to trust somebody. You either trust the hospital. 
you trust the organization, you trust the individual physician, um, so trust is big. And the same thing happens, probably the next thing down on the, on the list of life or death is your finances. Mm. So if somebody says you really need to do this with your money, or well, this is how you need to live your life, and how you invest or whatever, you, you need to trust that person. Uh, or that organization, if you trust Bank of America or you trust your local bank, you know, so what is it? Or do you trust the person? You trust the, the banker, the loan officer, the mortgage officer, the, you know, so they do share a lot of things in common and that biggest thing is trust. So a lot of my work had to do with depicting scenes and ways that these organizations could be trusted and kind of creating a world that felt like you could trust this organization in the work, whether it was radio scripts or television or print ads or billboards even. So that's what I was doing already. And that's what I had as a portfolio. So when I started the agency, it was okay. logical that I continue that work. Okay. So tell me a little bit about Sean Tracy Associates. How is it organized? What You're the principal. Do you have a permanent standing staff and the curio the thing i'm curious about is is my understanding of a lot of this of the world you work in is there's a lot of kind of temporary uh associations people come together do a project and then go off and do things uh, on, with other teams so tell me a little bit about kind of your core organization and then how does that how does that work right if i'm you're no you're absolutely <laughs> correct in that we take pride in the fact that we have what we call the Hollywood model. And it really has a lot to do with my beginnings as a, as a film director. Um, you know, Steven Spielberg doesn't employ all the people that you see at the end of the credits all the time. He pulls those people together, the right people at the right time for that particular project. So that's what we do. Like we've had Bigelow T for 14, almost 15 years now. And the team is the same, but I only employ two of them that are on that team. And there are other people that have been on the team for 15 years that kind of, what I call sort of permalancers. They don't answer to me every day. I have one art director who's, who works with me on four different accounts and she's been with me for 14 years. She tried to work with me in the office every day a couple years ago and it just wasn't her thing. But we really make a great team. So that's all good, you know, when you, when you it's like when you put a film production together, you grab the best people for that particular project and the cinematographer or the art director or the props person on one job may not be the right person. If you're shooting sports one day and you're shooting something else the next day, you may need different people with different skills. So that, that gives us the ability to keep it fresh. It also gives us the scalability. So if we get more work, I'm not telling my clients you have to wait because my core team, the guys that I employ, the people that I employ, are not, you know, they're not available right now. You have to wait, you know, take a cue and wait two or three weeks. No, we just bring in one of the other members, team members that we've worked with before that may specialize in that sort of discipline and we add them to the team. So we can get more work done and be more flexible, more nimble. And we also don't have to charge clients for people who are sitting in our office, you know, in Thanksgiving and Christmas week that they're probably not doing that much. Okay. So it yeah. works out for both parties and, um, and it keeps it keeps it interesting, keeps it fresh. So uh, you've got, let's say, sound guys that you a, a, a group of sound guys that you work on for different different things. Um, is is the ability to bring them in and, and integrate them into the projects? This is a management kind of question. Yeah. Is, is this and trying to understand your market? Um, how much is it? that they know you and your idiosyncrasies and your way of doing things and how much of it is there's a common understanding among all sound guys that this is how you integrate with a, uh, a, 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 a an agency that's a great question in fact um, I'm glad you asked it yeah. there's a guy named Brian Tracy uh -huh. I do have a brother Brian Tracy but uh, it's not the not, guy not brother. there's a guy that is well known for um, uh, motivational speaking and organizational management, if you've heard of him, but he does, you know, the tape series okay. of years ago and whatever. And I used to listen to them. And um, it's about organizational management and leadership. And, and uh, he's very smart and written a lot of books as well. And uh, he had this one story 
where he told on this um, DVD series or something that I listened to or saw, and he said, you know, you want to really know how every corporation in the world would love to figure out how to work? Go on a film set. And he said, because I just did a promo for one of my new upcoming DVD series, and I couldn't believe it. The director was from L.A., this guy's from New York, the cinematographer had never worked with any of the people. I mean, they flew him in from some other place, and the sound guys were from one place, and the props people, and the producers were from some... And they all get together, and literally, they show up at 6 in the morning, and by 10, they're working like a team. And, they're, and if somebody's a little bit weak, or somebody's, you know, they shore it up, and somebody will get over into that department and make sure things don't go wrong. He said, you never see that in a big corporation. They'll, like, let them die, right? Right. And... And he said, you just got to see, it's like clockwork. And then these people go off at the end of a couple of days or, or the end of this project, and some of them will never see each other ever again. And other people may, you know, call them and say, hey, you were great to work with on the last job. You want to be my second on this one or come in and do that job on this one. But it is, it's like everybody knows their role. It's a little bit of a plug and play situation. If you know the role well, yeah. you can do it on any set with any group of people. And so therefore... You know, it's, a, it's kind of a military leadership, though. There's the director at the top, uh -huh. and the director only talks to the cinematographer who's in charge of all the camera department, the gaffers, the grips, and everything, and the dolly grips and whatever. You won't see the second or third dolly grip going up to the director asking him, where should I lay the track? It doesn't happen, because the director has other things to think about that day. So it's, there's a lot of hierarchy there, and I think much like the military. Yeah, sure. Um, Absolutely. And it works. And it works in that you can literally show up with 30 or 40 people on a day that have never worked together and you can work like a clock just a couple hours into the deal. So to get into this business, you do have to learn these uh, industry standards though. Yes. The, you're, if you're the dolly right. grip guy, you know you don't go talk to the protocol. Director. So the protocols are understood. You have to learn how to behave on a set. You have to learn the protocol. You have to learn what your job is, where it starts, where it ends what you can say, what you can't say, when it's your, it's your obligation to you know, put your hand up or say, these batteries are running out, uh, we need to either recharge them, stop shooting, or do something because we're gonna run out of juice in 10 minutes. You know, that's, you know, if you're the guy that's in charge of the batteries, then you better tell somebody so that you don't run out in the middle of an important take or you know, something like that. Okay. So yeah. That's interesting. Uh, it, it's, it, was a good, it was a good field to come from to learn management and leadership, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, so, how important is reputation in that? In that, um, it's everything. World? It's, it's everything. everything. It's everything. In fact, one of my biggest mentors, who I just spoke to the other day at 96 years old, is um, Bill Butler, okay. and uh, he's a cinematographer that's one of the top five that's ever been. He shot Jaws. Oh wow! He shot okay. Wong Fu Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He shot Rocky. Um, tons of other great movies, um, and. He is all about his reputation. He's worked with Spielberg and Francis Ford Coppola, and you name it, he's worked with them, and everybody loves him. Because he's a consummate professional, he's easy to work with, he has very little ego, he's kind to everybody on the set, he's never, um, you know, he just never abuses anybody or lets anybody know that they don't know what they should know. He's just, he's just there to do the best he can possibly do with everybody on that team that day. So, you know, reputation, as you said. He has a tremendous reputation for being both talented and a sweetheart. Yeah. And so was Albert Mazel's. Okay. I mean, there, there are guys that, that get through life in a lot of businesses not being easy to deal with or pleasant or collaborative or whatever, but I have had the luck of working with some who are both talented and pleasant and just great people. So I try to follow that model as much as I can. That's, that's who I emulate. So when you're reaching out, you need somebody to come to a project or work with a project. You, how do you reach into the community? If somebody you maybe you don't, somebody you normally would work with isn't available. How do you how do you then find that the, the right person? Well, to, to when you're role? looking for those people, and I do this all the time, I think that um, advertisers, clients, uh, the the best. I was just talking to somebody today about this. Is that we get pretty much all of our business through um, leads 
from other people, meaning I have a bank client that literally was at an awards show and we were taking all kinds of awards and they get up and they thanked us for turning a project around in like two days that would have taken anybody else many, many weeks. And another woman in the room who was a marketing director said, well, that's not my agency. She asked, who is that? And my client said, here's who they are and you need to talk to them if you're experiencing that problem because they'll really, they, you know, they really will go to bat for you. So, I'm sorry, I got off track on the. Yeah, your so question it, was, was? it was getting into the finding people to work, to yeah. join your team okay, if, so, if so, you don't have somebody. Yeah. My point was that um, I think that good clients start looking for their agencies, their next agency, well before they need one. And so they're watching the horizon and saying, oh, okay, that, that's interesting. That's a good, that's, that agency did a, some really good work. Or I really like those ads or that, that whole project or that campaign that they did. And many, sometimes many years will go by. So I do the same thing when I'm looking for talent. I'll see something that I really like and I say, well, who did that? Who did the art direction for that? Who was the writer on that? Uh, so I start collecting names. And I reach out, and I'll reach out even if they're gainfully employed somewhere else at the time, or they're not able to do any freelance work, or they're not able to, you know, work on something with me now. That could change, and you know, in LinkedIn and those kind of things these days are amazing opportunities to develop a network that you can, you know, reach out to and say, hey, you know, I, I need a great writer for a blog project about this specific thing. Who has that experience that you know? And then, you know, I, you know, you've got thousands of people out there that certainly can refer you to somebody that they know. And if you trust that person, then it's probably a pretty good chance that the person they recommend or refer to you is going to be good. All right. Well, let me ask, so how do you manage your relationships with these, with these subcontractors or, or temporary partners that you, you work with? <laughs> That's an interesting question because the funny part is that in some ways, it's easier to manage those people than it is to manage full-time employees. Because I think there's an understanding that there's no long-term obligation. So, you know, I say almost in a, I'm not saying this in a negative way, but they know that they're only as good as the last job that they did for us. Yeah. So they're gonna work really hard every time they get up to the plate and they're gonna swing the bat as hard as they possibly can because there's no guarantee that they're gonna get up and swing the bat again on the next project. So I think it's a great, it's, a, it's an incentive. It's a self-motivation, it's an incentive. Yeah. Uh, and so I've had absolutely no issues managing people who I don't employ that you know, come into work for me for projects. It, right. It's been great relationships. And yeah. Many of them have gone on for 10, 12, 14, 15 years and we're still working with the same people. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so the advantage is, is they have a strong incentive to, to bring their best game, as you said. Yeah. Any disadvantages to that that you see? The only disadvantage that I see, and this is from that proprietary, you know, selfish point of view, which I try not to um, indulge myself in too often, is that if I don't employ them enough, Sometimes they go off and do something great for somebody else. <laughs> and that bothers me. <laughs> That's cool. Um, you wrote a, an article, uh, What You Don't Know Can Hurt Your Brand, uh, that was published in the American Hospital Association's healthcare advertising publication, uh, Spectrum. And your comment, one of the comments I, I took out of, the, out of your article was, today most advertisers slash agency relationships are short-lived and fickle. Clients abandon their agencies just as the agency is starting to understand the organization's brand and its objectives. And this seems to kind of go uh, along the lines of what you were saying that a lot, of, a lot of clients are looking for the next agency well ahead of when they, when they actually might need it. So why, why is it that you think a lot of, of organizations maybe switch agencies too soon? Is that it? Was that? Yeah, the, is no, that the you're, right you're capturing the, 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 the spirit of that article well. You know, maybe it's that, or more often than not, it's that there's changeover in the organization, in the advertiser's organization. So, you know, it's typical that every new marketing director or CMO that comes in wants to make their own mark. They want to make changes to the brand, they want to 
maybe uh, work with an agency they've worked with before. And we've been the beneficiary of that in many instances where, you know, one of our good clients goes off and works somewhere else at the next bank or something or the next hospital and takes us with them. And so that, that's been really great for us. You know, we have loyalty from a lot of our, our best clients. But on the other hand, we haven't had the opposite happen to us much, which is great. And I think that's just, it may be a bit of um, luck to some extent, but we've survived multiple changeovers at many of our clients, uh, you know, one of them with three different marketing directors in as many years. And I think that's really lucky. But, you know, I don't really know why an organization would either prefer or even allow that changeover. Um, in fact, you know, recently we had a, a client that changed over a marketing director and they brought in a consultant and said, well, what should we do? And we, you know, should we enhance the marketing department or add a few more people or whatever? And the consultant, who was a third party independent person, came in and said, you know, you've been through so much change in the rest of the organization in the marketing department, the best thing you can do is hold on to the agency because they've been with you for eight years and know the brand better than anybody else in the organization. So at that time, the CEO, who we've worked with all along, was not that much involved with the day-to-day -day marketing. He has his eyes on it, but he's not involved with it. But he came into the meeting with the new marketing director and said, you know, you're the new marketing director and you're whatever, and here's your agency, right? And I, that was a little comfortable, because usually the first thing that I do when management changes in the marketing department, it's I go have lunch with the new marketing director, and I bring my contract, and I hand it to him, and I say, you inherited this. There's six months left, there's two years left, whatever the time is, you don't have to have it. You know, just let me be the first one to know. I have a small agency and it's really important to us, but if you're gonna let us go because you have loyalty to another firm, I've enjoyed that from other clients and I totally understand that. You have a favorite person to work with, we can't be that person with years of history, but just let us know. And every time I've done that, it seems like it's diffused the situation and they said, well, let's give it a shot for six months and see how it goes. And then if I don't like you, then I'll work with the agency I worked with before. And that's happened like four times in the past five or six years. And we still have all those accounts. Okay. So you, you referred to yourself as a small agency. Yep. What's the difference be, for a client working with a small agency like yourself versus, say, a large agency? What, what do you bring to the table? What does a large agency bring to the table? What's the benefit of working with you versus, and right. I don't know the language, but a big, a big or, agency. A yeah. big agency. Well, um, you'd have to ask my clients, but most of my clients, I think, would tell you, and when, when we get new business opportunities, I refer them to clients who've worked with us, many of them who have had agencies well over 10 times or 20 times our size, and every single one of those clients will tell you that they like working with a small agency or us better when we're more responsive. It matters to us more. That's one thing. It's very much it's like what you see is what you get. If we go in and make a presentation, we win the account, this is who you're getting. You're not going to get switched to the B team after you win the account. So that's one difference. We're definitely more nimble, more responsive. I think at least our reputation in the markets, so both healthcare and financial, is that we're more creative than the average agency and more probably more creative than the large agencies because they tend to eventually try to, you know, if they've got clients all over the country doing the same thing, they want to create something that they can create once and use widely, yeah. right? And change the names and the logos, but basically the philosophy, the, the strategy could be the same. And we do everything custom every time because mostly we're, we're working in New England. So we can't even have something show up that is the same from one bank to another or one hospital to another. So it's, it's very custom. So you've talked a lot about branding. And yeah. What's a brand? So, you know, I mean, okay. I think a lot of people think of like a logo. They think of something like that. But that's not what a brand is in my understanding. So tell me, what do you mean when you say brand? The brand is, um, it's the pull. It's the, it's... It's trying, you know, the brand is the company's essence. It's all the experiences that a customer or a patient in a healthcare situation will come to have with that organization. 
It's every visit that you go to the doctor's office or even the way the parking lot is set up and all of those things, the way you're greeted when you walk in, that's part of the brand experience. So, you know, sometimes people misunderstand a brand as the logo or the graphics or the colors and things, and that's all part of it, but it's so much more than that. It's everything that you are to your customer or your prospect. That's the brand okay. and every experience that they have. And it comes, it should come first. You should establish what that brand essence is and how you're going to differentiate it. Or, or actually, you understand that brand first and you know what it is. It is what it is. You know, you can, you can establish a brand and try to create a brand, but that's, that's organizational. And, and also, the brand is also much dictated by what's in the perception of your customer's mind. You can't always control all of those things okay. that they have in mind. There's sometimes there's baggage from years ago, something that somebody had a bad experience or something. That's all part of your brand, <laughs> you know, yeah. and you can't... Like it or not. Re like it or not. Yeah. Uh, and then marketing is the stuff that you try to tactically um, manage. Yeah. It's the, the push, you know, features and benefits and marketing strategy and, and that should follow a good understanding of what the essence of, the, of your brand is. Yeah. And so, I guess what you're trying to do is create, you know, get the brand, the perception of your brand as it is today to eventually be, you know, where you want it to be, but it also has to be something that's relatable and important to your prospects, your patients, your customers. So you can have a brand, for instance, and have it not be the brand that people want. To, you know, they're not interested in. They're interested in a caring brand and you're a technology brand. Okay. So you have to understand your market and see if you're in the right place with the right message. So what, you, what I'm hearing you say is the brand itself is kind of organic. And um, I mean, you can't make it something that it's not. Is that is that true? Uh, you can position yourself. You can position yourself. I, I guess I wouldn't say that. That sounds because kind of fatal. It. Like uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say. Okay. I think you know there are things that organizations can do to live into a brand and become a better brand and a different brand uh -huh. and a more attractive brand. But it isn't something that you can just fix with an ad or a campaign. Right. The brand is kind of it's much and, more it's yeah. much more like who you are and your essence and and those things change much less rapidly than tactical campaign. Yeah. marketing campaign. But maybe a, a tactical campaign could bring out the best of what that is. Well, an HR campaign that, you know, works at finding the right people to put on the bus and right. get the right doctors and the right nurses and the right morale yeah. could change a brand yeah. radically over the course okay. of time. That's and it's true. probably not right. going to happen in six months. It will probably in six years. But that's changing right. the actual essence of the organization. Exactly. At the same and time. the mission of that brand could change too. Yeah. So one of your so speaking of the HR brand, uh, one of your clients was went with Douglas, a community hospital that my program does a lot of work with. Um, it's uh, just the next town over from, from here at UNH. Uh, your work with Wentworth Douglas started with the HR department, mm. is my understanding. Yes. Um, why did the HR department need rebranding? <laughs> what did that... There was a, um, still is, uh, a very brilliant woman there named Erin Flanagan, and she came from Timberland. And Timberland, as you know, is sort of one of the top brands in the country to work for. It was for many, many years. And so she was head of HR there. And so she had a, maybe an un healthcare like approach to internal branding. She wanted uh, a brand that was specifically for the employees and not the external brand. And she wanted to work on that. And she didn't really like what she was seeing from a lot of the companies that did HR advertising agencies that did a lot of HR. They were kind of regurgitating the same sort of ideas. So um, she asked us to pitch them. We had done some work for Timberland. And uh, so she asked us to pitch them and said, you know, I kind of want the retail approach to HR branding for a hospital. But it's an internal, the yeah. audience was internal. All internal. Okay. Yeah. And so we approached it that way. We did a lot of research. We found out what, what people felt the essence of what they were doing and the brand was. The essence of the HR department. Of, of the, yeah, of the employee brand. Not necessarily 
from the external standpoint, not from the patient's perspective, but from the employee's standpoint, which was different. So how, how the employees felt about the HR brand or about themselves? Or? About the work that they were doing okay. and about the hospital as, okay. you know, as a part of the community. Okay. And that was fascinating. It was really the first work that I did that was specifically HR oriented and you know luckily with with a great partner and collaborator um Aaron you know we I think we came up with something really good and she was you know she really ran it up the flagpole and to the extent that eventually the external marketing department who we weren't working with at the time and the board and Greg Walker and president and president yeah. yeah all said you know, wow, what's that? We want that, right? For the whole. Yeah, for the whole thing. But the funny thing was that the, the um, you know, the uh, sort of rallying point, or slogan, if you call it, for the internal brand was where you belong. And I said, no, 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 stop the wheels. You can't have that because the community doesn't belong in the hospital, right? <laughs> okay. I said, so we, we got to adapt that, right? Okay. So we had some meetings and we, we said, yes, we'll tackle it and we'll try to keep it so that it dovetails okay. with where you belong. Uh -huh. But it became, um, you know, where we care and where um, yeah, other phrases that were more patient-centric appropriate, and appropriate, so, yeah. you know. But some of the same types of imagery and whatever. And so we kind of co-opted that idea, as you say, dovetailed it. We, it grew into the external marketing, and that was with Noreen Beal, who was there for quite a few years as the marketing director and she was also a very brilliant uh, person that really knew what she was doing so uh, it was it was fun it was it was a great project for a long period of time tell me a little more about the the tactics uh, involved in your developing the internal brand so you you talk to employees did a lot of research we had a lot of you know one-on-ones and focus groups with all service lines yeah. and leaders from every department and rank and file and uh, so all the way through the whole organization. Mm -hmm. And we tried to define what it was that they shared in common, what all of these people shared in common, sort of a rallying point and a, and a, and a feeling and that became this where you belong, meaning that they felt like they really belonged to an organization that was really doing excellent care, excellent service to the community, and providing excellent health care. Yeah, and I believed it because the, yeah. the difference is I've worked for, well, I guess I'll leave them unna unnamed. Yeah, yeah, that's a larger, especially if larger, <laughs> yeah, You told me you were going to keep me out of trouble. So yeah. much larger uh, organizations in much larger cities and yeah. states, yeah. Uh, you know, across the country. Yeah. And, you know, I would go into a hospital in somewhere in, in Ohio or a hospital somewhere in New York or a hospital or whatever, to do my work, you know, to, to create advertising, whatever. And you just feel this heads down feeling. Like you walked in and even the people that we were interviewing or the people that we were talking to, whether they be doctors or nurses, whatever, had this like, ah, head yeah. down, uh -huh. I'm tired, don't talk to me, I'm overworked, I'm whatever. And at Wentworth, I didn't feel that at all. At Wentworth, it was heads up. It was walking down the hall, you know, I didn't have a badge on, hey, how you doing? What can I help you find something, you know? You know, what are you doing? Oh, oh, we're with the advertising. Oh, great. Yeah, I saw some ads recently. Oh, they're fantastic. You know, just really positive. So there was a positive vibe. And, you know, I actually switched my health care there for that reason. I yeah. live, you know, I live very close, but I wasn't going there. Right. But I said, these people are really well adjusted. I want them working on me, <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather that. You know, yeah. I'd rather have somebody that's positive and that, that feels like they're there to, to you know, to do the best they can do that day, yeah. and and that's what that's what was going on. So you were trying, as you were doing this research, interviewing focus groups. What you're trying to get at was the organic. What's this yeah, brand? The what's brand the essence, yeah. So that the you employee could then brand essence, play to which that. Is different than uh -huh. you know, the other patients' things. experience, patient experience, or institutional, because many times institutional is like you know whether they're trying to talk about the latest CAT scan that the technology that they have or the new shark or the new Da Vinci machine or whatever, that doesn't have much to do with the person yeah. that is delivering care on the, on the patient floor. Okay. So the desire by the HR director to, to revise and revisit her, her, her department's brand ultimately was, what was, what was that? What, so what did, she, what, did, what did she want from you? And I realized I she wanted a, 
she wanted a brand that would um, help her retain and recruit talent, the best talent, period. Okay. Period. And you know, it's very, uh, these people who have these types of skills, nursing and, and doctors and, and radiologists and all these, they are in huge demand. Right. They can work anywhere they want to work in the country for any organization. They can go for a huge teaching hospital in New York City or Boston or Cincinnati, or they can go to any place they want to go. So it's all about community, lifestyle, where they want to raise their kids. Um, what's, what's it going to be like to go to work every day with these people that I'll be working with? So we wanted to establish that this was, you know, and, and luckily uh, what we uncovered was a pretty good thing, meaning we didn't have to, you know, shine it up or, or you know, try to make it better than it was, yeah. uh, which, you know, you have to be authentic in this stuff because, you know, it doesn't last very long if you're not. But uh, luckily the authenticity um, of it was just, we just needed to expose it and show what these people really thought. And I think that we did a good job with that. I think, yeah. um, the, you know, people looked at the material that we created and they were like, wow, I get it. I see those people. I want to be one of them. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, now that you've worked with, you've worked with Wentworth, but not just Wentworth, you've worked with a number of healthcare organizations, so this is not specific to Wentworth, but what do healthcare executives need to know about branding? And, and kind of along that line, what, do, what seems to be the thing that healthcare executives in particular, but maybe some of your clients in general, um, misunderstand about it? Or, or what do you have to really educate? In I'm thinking in particular healthcare, but if it's general or if it's broader, that's fine too. So, the healthcare executives, I, I think that there are very few these days that think that the brand is the logo or the graphics or just the tagline and the brochures and executions. I think, fortunately, most executives in healthcare these days know much better than that. They know that patients are behaving more and more every day like consumers, yeah. and that they want transparency in pricing, they want a say in their own healthcare decisions, they want collaboration and partnership with their providers, and uh, I think they're also realizing that they're gonna shop. Um, and just like we say about any good brand, that people will drive further, wait longer, and pay more for what they perceive as the best quality and the best brand. And I think that's all good. And I, so I, I think executives need to know that if they don't know that. Yeah. It's a changing world. Yeah. Okay. How has the advertising industry, the branding industry, uh, and the work you do kind of changed over the last 20 years? How it's changed today is that there are so many more moving parts than there were 20 years ago. The advent of um, the internet and social media and digital and even the um, sort of fragmenting of your audiences. You used to be able to you know, buy a network TV spot on the, on the news and you're pretty sure you're gonna hit most of your audience. And now, you know, you're not so sure. They can be anywhere. So there are a lot of moving parts and all of those need to coordinate and be integrated and work together. So I think it's harder than ever to establish and send a consistent brand message. It's a lot more work than it used to be. I, everybody I know that's been in the business for more than, you know, 15 years says, you know, oh my God, it's just, you know, we not only have to do that and that and that, the billboards and the radio and the TV and the this and that, but now we have to manage everybody's social media expectations and be 24 seven answering, you know, every, every thing that comes in in social media. And then we have to have digital ads and then we have to have, you know, thought leadership and uh, content and, you know, blogging and, and update our website every six months where it looks like, like some antiquated dinosaur website, you know? So it's, uh, it's a lot, it's a lot to do. I, I, I look at some of the marketing departments and marketing directors that we deal with. And, you know, I realize that they have an overwhelming job. It's, it's tremendous. Yeah. Where would you like to see your firm in 20 years? <laughs> Where do I want to be in 20 years? Um, in 20 years, I would love to be involved with organizations at the highest level in terms of creating, creating the brand, helping to create the brand, the strategy, sort of the broad strokes, big 
idea, groundbreaking, earth shattering, company building, making ideas. And honestly, I would probably like to be doing less of the day to day cranking out ads right. for companies because you know the big stuff is more is more important. It's more fun. Yeah. And so I I know that there are firms in in the country that have grown to be more of a consultancy and with the work that I do at Emerson and as I as I grow in my own learning process and and I get to rub elbows with some really smart people both at healthcare organizations and at the university level I'm learning every day and so someday I hope that we can do just you know that really fun great earth-shattering top-level work yeah neat well, let, let me ask you a few questions about leadership. Uh, so also from the uh, article you wrote for the Hospital Association, one of the pieces I kind of liked was you said, uh, you probably know that advertising agencies are full of egos. They have to be, it takes a healthy ego to believe you can come up with great ideas. What you might not know is that the largest of these egos are probably as fragile as they are big. To get the best ideas and the best results from your agency's creative team, you should respect their process, not rush them needlessly, and be diplomatic in rejecting concepts you think are not appropriate or you just don't like. And I was thinking about, as I was reading that, I'm, I'm immediately drawing some parallels to healthcare. There's a lot of big egos mm -hmm. in healthcare. Um, and they, you know, some great doctors do some great stuff. So tell me about, tell me about how you manage fragile big egos or big fragile egos big fragile egos well i think I, I told you before that some of the mentors that i've worked with are really they they were at the very top of their game and it feels like to me that the ones that get to that place you know like i said they may have a big enough ego to think that they can do something that they've never done before but at the same time, they're not into um, stepping on anybody else in order to prove that they're bigger. So I think that just being um, collaborative and trying to open your mind to the possibility that you don't know everything and that you may not have the best idea and that sometimes, and I've had this happen, yeah. I've had brainstorming sessions uh, for very important creative projects when the best idea came out of an intern that started two days ago. I'm yeah. like, oh, wow. You know, that's yeah. like, uh oh, you know, so that checks your ego yeah. right there. Yeah. And I think you have to be open to that. You have to be open to the fact that, you know, everybody, everybody's opinion can count. Everybody's ideas have value. Um, and I think the best people that, that do the best work are, are those kind of people. Yeah. They're collaborative. What would you say is your leadership philosophy? So you're a leader, you do some, it, what the, the kind of leadership you do is really fascinating to me with these, these very kind of changeable teams. So what would you say, how would you, how would you capture your leadership philosophy? As I said, I, I like to keep my mind open. It, there's, a, there's almost a dual thing, and my wife has noticed this, is that if you're open to all the possibilities, but at the same time, you're laser focused on where you're going. You can get some really good results, which means that you know where you're going, but sometimes as you go, you collect some information along the way that kind of uh, makes you find a better course um, or refines that. So, you know, as a leader, I like to give room and opportunity for others to offer ideas and to collaborate. I listen a lot. I listen to my clients. I feel that that's a very collaborative thing. I, I never come in in any organization and pontificate and say, here's how we did it before and I can tell you that this isn't going to work and that's not going to work, what you're doing here. No, I want to find out what, you know, first of all, what their goals are, what their experience has been. And their organization or their predicament, marketing goals or marketing um, issues, for instance, may be very different than what I think they are. It could be political, it could be geographical. It could be staffing, availability of the service lines or doctors or whatever. You know, they could be going through problems that I have no clue about. And then they've been having multiple meetings for years about some of this stuff. And I come in with a big answer 
and it can be completely wrong. So I have to listen. And and as I said, you know, when, when, at our company, when we have brainstormings, we we involve everybody, even the the intern who started yesterday. And every once in a while, you know, everybody comes up with a great idea. So, and I say this when I do creative workshops. The first thing you should say when somebody comes up with an idea is yes and, not no. That will never work. What do you look for when you're when you're bringing on people who are going to have a leadership role in your in your team, whether that's a permanent member or a or a temporary member? What what kind of characteristics or traits are you looking for? Again, I, I you look for people that can collaborate, people that can lead by example that like to do the work that they're doing not dictatorial and are able to get the best out of the people that they're working with through a you know a friendly style yeah what kind of culture do you try to create at at, at sean tracy associates the culture we are a little bit like a family because we're that small so we're, we don't have a you know a a lot of hierarchy in the organization. It's kind of a flat organization. So people are really responsible for their own clients and their own projects. And they get supported by other team members, but there's not a lot of meetings, for one thing. We, we, I know that some of my clients are just tied up in meetings all the time. They can't, it's hard for them to get anything done. They go from one meeting to the next meeting to the next meeting, you know, all day long. And so we, we try to eliminate that. We work a lot in a sort of an open, bullpen type area so people know what's going on when we're involved with a project. We don't need to have a lot of meetings to you know, get out of our private offices in order to have a meeting to know what's going on. So you know, that, that's, the organization feels like at its best a team, you know, a good, a good well-honed team where everybody's working towards the same goal. Yeah. You mentioned you had some mentors that seemed to be important to you in kind of your growth as a um, a, a, as a professional in the field, what did those people do for you? What does a and what does a good mentor do? I think that what I learned from my men mentors is, uh, or what they allow you to do, what a good mentor does, is to help you be your best. They're not trying to say you need to be like me. This is how I did it and how you should do it, but more they recognize your own unique talents and they help you cultivate those talents and, they, and sometimes and I've done this with people um, you notice something and you notice either where they're they need to grow and you give them stuff to do to grow to, to work on that exercises or projects or things and you say this would be a good thing for you to learn how to do or to experience doing and and maybe they didn't realize that that this was something that was going to either be very difficult for them or, or a revelation when they do it. But um, I think that's what a mentor does. It's kind of, you know, it's that, it's sort of like working with a Taekwondo master who really can see. It's funny, I always say about my, my grandmaster, who he can t recognize on the day you walk in the school how good you're going to be six years later. Because he can just see it. He sees how you walk, he sees how you move, he sees how you're, I don't know, maybe it's just something he trained the Olympic, the first Olympic team for the U.S. for Taekwondo. Maybe, maybe just he kind of looks at what kind of muscle twitching you have. I don't know what he does, but he can tell you. And I remember one day watching these two young boys come in. They were from the same family, and one of them was just, just too all over the place. He couldn't even do jumping jacks without like, you know, moving around ten feet in a circle and just like was wacky. And he told me after he says, "Oh, watch out for him." Give him five years, he's going to be the best in the school. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and he was. He yeah. turned into that. So, yeah. you know, a mentor recognizes things and sees where your strengths and your weaknesses are and helps you, you know, work those things out. Are you, do you see yourself uh, as a mentor now to anyone? Are you, do you, does any, do you feel like anyone kind of looks to you for that kind of knowledge and experience? I think that that's, um, probably the the thing that I do every day and yeah. the thing that I, I do the most with my own staff um, and now you know at college um, that and it's actually 
it's the most rewarding thing I think for me. It has, you know, it has more longevity and it has more meaning than even creating a good campaign for a client. Is that when I think that somebody that has worked with me or worked for me, uh, or a student that I've encountered for a year or even a semester, that somehow I've taught them something or mentored them in such a way that their life or their career may improve. That's great stuff. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Right. So on, on that thought, what does success mean? And what does it look like for uh, you, both personally see. and professionally? What would... uh, success for me is continuing to grow personally. Um, I'm never done learning. Um, I'm a big fan of um, continuing to understand more about both what I'm doing professionally and just people in life, um, and as I said, helping others, mentoring, um, and personal successes, helping brands, advertisers reach their marketing goals and see them succeed. So let me, uh, let me kind of close on, on uh, this last question. So we've got, I, I teach uh, mostly undergrads and trying to prepare them to go out into the, to the workforce. And one of the things we talk about is personal branding. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give, based on your experience as a professional brand manager and, and brand developer, as well as as, a, as an artist and, and an entrepreneur, um, how important is it to cultivate your own brand as a professional? And what would that mean for a healthcare executive in your experience? I think these days, it's a nonstop, sort of never-ending job to promote and evolve your own personal brand. Frankly, it's easier for me because my name is on my company. So a lot of the work that my company does automatically reflects back to me as a personal brand. So I'm very lucky. They're intertwined for me. But for others, without their name on a company, it's definitely important uh, for people to manage and maintain a good personal brand. So in some ways it's easier today than it ever was because you have things like LinkedIn and you literally, you can be your own broadcaster or publisher, you know, like your uh, you right. know, series here with Healthcare Forge is, tr is tremendous and it, that's part Excellent. of your personal brand. <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, reflects really well back on you because you are a thought leader and expert and you're meeting with other people that are. So that's really a great example. You're, you're a great example. But, um, I wasn't fishing for a compliment. No, I know, I know you weren't. But and, and I, you know, <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate you, it. You give me the, the uh, I'll give you twenty dollars <laughs> on the table, right? But you know, blogging platforms and other things, it's it's come more. E it's it's easier in a way because there are more vehicles to to do this, promote your own brand. But it's also more difficult again because uh, there's so many digital and other platforms out there that you know. I think. In our parents' days, you could go to a chamber meeting once a month and, pe you know, that would be your personal brand, right? People know who you were. You were the real estate guy in town or you were the banking guy or whatever. But it's so much more complicated than that right now. But, you know, in terms of possibilities, I like, you know, I'm a big fan of speaking and speaking opportunities. And I think that can enhance and promote your brand. I, I do that um, in, you know, doing uh, seminars and things, being a thought leader. As you say, blogging, whatever. There's been people, there was a president of CEO of Beth Israel some years back, I can't remember, it was like 2006, um, Paul Levy, that created a tremendous personal brand through like the first blog where he was sort of transparent about what was going on in his organization. And that was a, you know, that was pretty revolutionary in its time. You know, and I think, you know, any way you can these days to promote your brand. At the same time I say that, I, Sometimes I feel I've seen people that seem to spend so much time working on their personal brand that I'm, if I were their employer, I'd be wondering, is this good for us? Right. And I actually mentioned it. Um, I don't know if I told you, but one of the other ways that we enhance the size of our agency is that I'm a member of a 17 agency consortium. Okay. And we meet three times a year. We share best practices and we share capabilities. So I engage, two or three of the firms are engaging them right now to build websites and do other things that we don't have as many programmers and people that they do that kind of thing. And they hire us to do something. So that, in, in effect, I can have as many as like 150 
marketing professionals or advertising professionals working for me at any given moment. And I get great response from them because we're all very collaborative. I've been a member of the ag uh, this agency network for over 10 years. So, you know, that, that is, a, is, a, is a, um, you know, a great opportunity. And one of the agency owners who will go unnamed has a young guy who has created a brand within his brand and he f managed to get himself a whole sort of office, you know, the show Office, uh, is it called The Office? Yeah, yeah. Type TV show that this agency has allowed him to do and he stars in it. And it's like a comedy show all about his stuff and his work as a creative director. And I called, you know, after seeing some episodes and he sent them, I called the owner of the agency and I said, what kind of a contract do you have this guy in? Because <laughs> he's going to become your biggest competitor real soon. <laughs> yeah. You know, and yeah. he said, no, he just had a baby, he's whatever, he's here, I got a long-term contract. <laughs> and he said, I think I'm mentoring him to take over the agency someday. Oh, nice. I said, okay, as long as you're, that's where uh -huh. you're headed. Uh -huh. I said, because his personal brand is becoming bigger than your agency brand. Right. So I don't know if that happens often in a big healthcare organization, but, right. yeah, totally. um, you know, I well, think you have I mean, to juggle the responsibility to promote the, the organizational brand, yeah, um, as well as your personal brand, unless you're me, and then you it's are all the same. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, um, thank you so much for your time today. This has been really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to the other uh, episodes that you've uh, you've you know put on, and, and listening to some of those healthcare leaders. And uh, it's great to have the opportunity to answer these kind of questions and talk about healthcare marketing. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community, and we'll talk with you again in about two weeks.